Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our final day with Dr. Jared Alcantara, our Hunger Lecture for 2021. And today he will speak to us on the God who saves and sends us in the wild. Um, Dr. Alcantara has been introduced to us uh, a number of times now this week. And so rather than reintroducing him, I'd like to just take this time that on behalf of the Beeson community to thank you so much, not only for your time, but sharing of yourself, your faith, your love for preaching. And as a teacher of preachers, we have been blessed and enlightened by uh, your being with us. And you are now officially a friend of Beeson and for a lifetime, okay? And, and we really have appreciated what you have done with us, and we look forward to today's lecture. Let's pray. Father, we offer you now our hearts and our minds. We want to worship you with our intellect. We want you to come, the work of your Holy Spirit, and kindle our hearts and fill us with a fire of your holy love that we might be more devoted and open to hearing your word and speaking it in all the ways that you call us in the days ahead. And we pray for our speaker, bless him and use him and speak to us through him, that we might be more equipped for the sake of your gospel in Jesus Christ's name. Good morning. It's good to be with you all. Thanks so much uh, to Dr. Pasquarello, to Dean Sweeney, to uh, to all of you, uh, staff, administration, students, everyone uh, has just been so generous and kind to me. Uh, we mentioned, uh, or I talked about this a little bit earlier in the week, that, uh, that not even a snowpocalypse could stop this from happening. So praise the Lord for that. I've been in touch with my, uh, with my wife. Those of you who were at the uh, Preaching Institute yesterday, my, my middle daughter got braces yesterday. So... I was checking my phone to make sure she was okay, and she was. Uh, she had spaghetti and applesauce for dinner. Uh, so that's, uh, that's my world, and that's the world I'll be uh, returning to. Well, we began the lecture yesterday uh, on the subject or on the theme, uh, the God who sees and calls us in the wild. Uh, and the lecture that I wanted to present to you today is the God who saves and sends us in the wild the God who saved and sends us in the wild. And I framed these lectures around the idea in Luke chapter 3 that the word of God comes to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, outside the establishment, outside the systems and powers and structures of uh, Caesar, all the way through the high priests and the tetrarchs. The word of God comes to John, the Zech Zech John son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and it is no accident that this takes place. I talked about how uh, there are reasons why we have negative depictions of the wilderness. You can find these negative depictions in Scripture. Um, confrontation, rebellion, sin, judgment, temptation. Uh, though, those are the, those, those, though those are prevalent uh, in the Scriptures, uh, I, of course, do not want to overlook them. I suggested yesterday that that's not what we're in danger of doing. What we might actually be in danger of doing is overlooking how sites of contestation can also be sites of transformation. How sites where uh, people are faced with an encounter can even become sites of new beginning and transformation. And so we began here with the opening lines of Pilgrim's Progress. As I walked through the wilderness of this world, I came upon a den, and there I sat down and fell into a sleep. And the Puritans picked up this language. Uh, Win uh, uh, Winford picked it up. Bradford picked it up. Mather picked it up. Uh, to describe something we must endure, travail, pass through. Now, there is something to be said for that, something important to be said for that. But what I want to do today, as I did yesterday, is try to force us into some rethinking or some reframing, so that we might actually have a more well-rounded understanding of how the wilderness is not just a space of contestation, but also a space of possibility a space of epiphanic encounter, a space of call, of seeing, and my theme today is a space of saving and a space of sending. So I asked myself, how could I uh, present a huge contrast to this? And so I settled on K uh, Kanye and Jay-Z. That's quite a contrast, right? 
Uh, so I mentioned this song, No Church in the Wild, a hip-hop ballad that came out in the year 2011, 10 years ago. That was so long ago, 10 years ago. Why should we care about a song that came out 10 years ago? Uh, shouldn't we care about uh, Kanye's uh, latest hip-hop album, Jesus is King, which he describes as this project as an expression of the gospel? So do we listen to those lyrics? Do we listen to the lyrics from No Church in the Wild? So is it the old lyrics, the new lyrics, both lyrics, different lyrics? Uh, should we pay attention to many other things that are vying for our attention, especially 10 years after this song came out? Let me suggest to you that what Kanye and Jay-Z say about the church is serious, and because it's serious, we should pay attention. Uh, perhaps they're pointing to what Mary McClintock Fulkerson describes as a wound in need of redress. So let me just play a short clip. Hopefully the audio doesn't blow your ears out. We'll see. So do we listen to those lyrics? Do we listen to these lyrics? Which lyrics should we listen to? They are pointing to a wound in need of redress. They are speaking about the church being absent from spaces of hopelessness and despair. Daniel White Hodge picks this up in his book, Homeland Insecurity, and here's what he writes. Jay-Z and Kanye ask the pertinent question. They force us to wrestle with those five little lines and they identify the problem for anyone wanting to preach the gospel or carry out mission in the United States. Simply put, there is no church in the wild. Is there a church for the thugs, the pimps, and the drug pushers? Jay-Z and Kanye are wrestling with this. They ask us to grapple with it as well. So what does it mean to say that there's no church in the there out there? It is to say that the wild is a place where the nihilist lives, where the believer who don't believe in anything goes, a locus obscunditus, a place of absence, a site of contestation outside the bounds of right belief, a life wholly different from the one we talk about in churches. Yes, a life wholly different can mean a life lived by your own rules in which you follow your own impulses outside the confines of ecclesiastical control, if that is your objective, then why would you want a church community at all? The lone female voice in a song at various points sings, I live by you, desire. I live by you, desire. So if you're looking for themes like self-autonomy and pleasure-seeking, you'll find them pretty quickly in a song like this one. But hedonism is only a partial explanation for why they argue that there is no church in the wild. There's also other reasons. Because a life wholly different can also mean a life wholly desperate, a life so plagued by violence and trauma that one is hard-pressed to find a church in the there out there because one is hard-pressed to find God in the there out there. The wild functions as a locus absconditus because Kanye and Jay-Z believe that the church is absconditus, nowhere to be found in situations marked by hopelessness and despair. To Kanye and Jay-Z, this is neither good nor bad, it just is. In a world of pain and promiscuity, survival and hopelessness, their lives exist outside the church's control, beyond the church's reach, violence begets violence, trauma begets trauma, death begets death out there in the wild. And so can there be a church in the wild? Is there a church in the wild and can there be what would it look like for God to save us in the there out there? And what would it look like by saving us to send us to the there out there? What would it look like for God to redeem a people at a site of contestation, thus transforming it into a site of new beginning? And so this is the theme of our second lecture, the God who saves us in the wild and sends us in the wild. And as with the first lecture, we'll divide this into two parts. And so we'll start with the God who saves us in the wild, the God who saves us in the wild. I want to argue that the God who saves us in the wild does so in order to send us to the wild so that we can be the church. God redeems us in the there out there 
so that he can send the church to be in there, out there. Now, before we turn to that theme, the God who saves us in the wild, let me just offer a word as a parenthetical note. Uh, our conception of the there, out there, whether we call this culture, the secular, society, the profane, our understanding of it will determine how willing we are to engage the world or to escape from it. That is to say, our commitment, or perhaps our lack of commitment to the world, rises and falls with our interrogation of the church's function in it. Is there a church in the wild? Is at its core a question about the church's relation to the world, and for the purposes of this lecture, about a question about whether our preaching engages the world as it is, or the world as we romanticize it to be. Preaching that engages the world as we romanticize it to be sounds common, stale, insular. By contrast, preaching that engages the world as it is sounds much less domesticated, much less tamed. It sounds like it is unwilling to shield itself from wounds in need of redress. Preaching that engages the world as we romanticize it to be abstracts itself from reality or it twists and subverts reality in order to assert its own extracurricular kingdom of this world agenda onto others, sometimes insisting on genuflecting before powers of an age that's passing away. By contrast, preaching that engages the world as it is seeks to jettison this worldly agendas for a kingdom agenda. It eschews alliances with powers of an age that is passing away for a spirit-infused theology of power as defined and described by Jesus himself. Moreover, it insists on bringing peace where there are sites of contestation, injecting hope in situations of impossibility. It maintains that real communities experience real hope when churches engage in real witness in the real world. The distinction I want to make here between preaching to the world as it is as opposed to the pre preaching as the world as we romanticize it to be has everything to do with the two themes that I want to discuss in this lecture, the God who saves and the God who sends. Concerning the theme of saving, Christian preachers cannot in good conscience point others to a God who saves us in the wild without an honest account of the reasons why God would need to save us in the first place. He did not come to make us better. He came to make us alive with Christ. Concerning the theme of sending, we cannot argue for a God who sends a people without presupposing that we need to be sent in the first place. That we're called out in order to be called forth and that only a word of hope from an almighty God has the dynamic power to redress the wounds of broken people living in a broken world in desperate need of healing. So with that parenthetical note in mind, let me talk about the God who saves us in the wild. For good reasons, uh, God-fearing Christians, Christian preachers in general, should and could make the instinctive turn to Calvary when we talk about God's salvation, and that would be for good reason. We hear about a God who saves us, and we hear Jesus. That's where our minds go, and of course, there's nothing wrong with making this necessary connection. So we will get there in a little bit. But sometimes, Sunday preachers turn into functional Marcionites in their thinking, preaching about a God of the New Testament only. So let me suggest to you that we must resist Marcionite urges and tendencies. The God of the Hebrew Scriptures is the God of Jesus Christ. The God of Israel is the God of the Church. The God of the Hebrew prophets is the God of the New Testament preachers. And so here is why this is important to highlight. Starting in the Hebrew Scriptures, God saves and redeems a people to himself in the there out there. We talked yesterday about this, that God sees and calls Hagar and uh, calls Moses. 
God also sees and calls us as preachers. We could also argue that God delivers Hagar and delivers Moses too. He saves Moses from anonymity and purposelessness. He saves Hagar from certain death in the wilderness. And he does this so that he might save a people as well. So the God who saves through finding and hearing and seeing is also the God who saves through calling and promising and commissioning. And the example par excellence of God's salvation is the exodus and the sojourn through the wilderness to the promised land. So that theme of exodus and sojourn is a theme that I want to emphasize before we move to the New Testament. So we know a lot about God's power and salvation in delivering Israel from captivity, the sending of the plagues, the Passover, the parting of the Red Sea. But let me suggest that God also displays his power and salvation in the Sinai sojourn itself. Manna in the wilderness. Quail not just at the shores of the Red Sea that God shows up for a people. And the Exodus event does not conclude after Pharaoh's army is swallowed up in the Red Sea or with the songs of Moses and Miriam in Exodus 15. The Exodus event concludes many years later in Joshua 3 when Joshua and the Israelites cross the Jordan River You see, the God who saves Israel from captivity and oppression under Pharaoh also saves Israel through the challenges and trials of the Sinai sojourn. God saves the people, shapes the people, prepares the people to become the nation that God desires it to be through the wilderness wanderings themselves. And yes, a whole generation dies off. And yes, there is murmuring and rebellion and judgment. Let me reiterate that these themes are themes that we should not overlook. And let me reiterate again that we are not in danger of overlooking them. We must also remember that God reveals the divine name in the wilderness, that God gives the Decalogue to the people in the wilderness, that God establishes and ratifies a covenant in the wilderness. We already know that the wilderness is a place where the nation sins. What we need to hear more often is that the wilderness is a place of God's initial and fundamental revelation to his people, to use Mauser's term. In fact, the wilderness can be a space of re-scripting, to use Brueggemann's term. This is Cadences of Home, and let me read it to you. And Brueggemann connects this to preaching. The invitation of preaching, not unlike therapy, is to abandon the script in which one has had confidence and to enter a different script that imaginatively tells one's life differently. The folk in the Bible are shown to be those who have often settled into a narrative that is deathly and destructive. Thus, the early Hebrews had settled for a slave narrative as their proper self-presentation. That narrative is disrupted by another narrative that has Yahweh, the liberator, as the key and decisive agent. The decision to stay in Egypt or leave for the promise is a decision about which narrative to follow, whether to understand the plot of life according to the character Pharaoh or according to a different plot featuring Yahweh. Mutatis, mutandis, The New Testament narratives portray many folk either in a narrative of hopelessness and despair or of self-righteousness and arrogance. In each case, they are invited into an alternative narrative, which is the narrative of the life-giving kingdom of God. Now, this was published in 1989. Some of you know the book, The Prophetic Imagination, or his preaching text, The Practice of Prophetic Imagination, in which he develops this idea that the Old Testament prophets engaged in a contest between narratives. There was a narrative that was passing away and the narrative of God. And one of their goals in what they had to say to the nation was to persuade the nation that the narrative of Yahweh was the right narrative to listen to, to engage in the act of rescripting as they preached. That's what's happening in the wilderness. A nation is being born and a people are being rescripted. 
Here's Mauser, whose name I mentioned earlier. Mauser puts it this way. Much more happens in the wilderness than a chain of miraculous rescues from danger. It can be said that in the wilderness, Israel was born as a nation. I might take it one step a little further and say that in the wilderness, Israel is born again as a nation. Much later in the story, especially in the prophet, the wilderness is a space, yes, where a generation dies off, and yes, where a generation murmurs, and yes, where people rebel and are judged, but the wilderness is not just a space where those things happen. There are also positive portrayals as well. I'll mention just a few. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Some of you have streams in the wasteland. God can do a new thing in the wilderness. God can make a stream even in the wasteland. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and I will bring her into the wilderness, and I will speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her vineyards, and make the valley of Achor, which means trouble, I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. Jeremiah 31, verse 2, we hear this promise to those in exile. The people who survived the sword will find favor in the wilderness. So those who are in exile need to hear this promise that the same God who met the nation on the Sinai sojourn will meet them in the exile as well. Exile, uh, Ezekiel 34, verse 25. I will make with them a covenant of peace and banish wild beasts from the land so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. When I was preparing for this lecture, this isn't in my notes, I reread The Life of Anthony by Athanasius, this desert father. And there are these confrontations with the evil one in the wilderness. And the evil one and the demonic spirits say to him, we must stop you because the Spirit of the Lord continues to invade this wilderness where we reside. So they beat him up and they leave him for dead and then he gets back up again and goes back once again. In fact, at the name of Christ, Satan flees. Somehow, God can banish wild beasts so that we may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. Again, I don't want to ignore the fact that there are all these negative themes as well. My goal is to bring us back to this simple idea from Archie France when he's commenting on the word of God coming to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. In Jewish thought, to be in the wilderness was to be prepared for a new beginning with God. Many interpreted the Isaiah 40 text, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare a new way for the Lord, eschatologically, and so the Essene community went out to the wilderness waiting for the day of the Lord. There's even a gloss in the Masoretic text. Some people ask, is it a voice crying, comma, in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord? That would shape the way we would have to consider it. There are two different versions of that particular passage, but you can read in intertestamental literature, in the Psalms of Solomon, the Testament of Moses, in many other places, this expectation that somehow God will show up here. God will save us here. In the Exodus and in the subsequent Sinai sojourn, God saves a people to himself to prepare a people for new life in the promised land. God forms, shapes, transforms, saves, saves again a people unto himself. And so we don't really need to gauge in any sort of hermeneutical acrobatics in order to make meaningful connections between the God who saves a nation and the God who saves us through Jesus Christ. 
course, we see this clearly in the revelation of God's character, God's heart, God's will, God's way, God's nature through Jesus Christ himself. In the there, out there, the word of God comes to prepare a way for the Lord. In the there, out there, John the Baptist says, one who is mightier than I, the one the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie, that one, that one is here, the fulfillment of Isaiah 49 and 53, the mighty one, that one has come, and he will meet us in the wilderness. He is the one who will baptize with the Spirit and with fire. He is the one who is the fulfillment of the Isaiahic prophecy. And through him, every valley will be exalted. Every hill will be made low. The crooked places will become straight and the rough places plain. Through him and through his baptism, the heavens will be opened. The Spirit, the spirit will descend. A voice will come from heaven declaring that he is indeed the beloved Son with whom the Father is well pleased. As the story unfolds, it, we read at the beginning of Luke chapter 4 that after Jesus' baptism, it is the Spirit who leads him into the wilderness in order that he might be tempted by the evil one. For 40 days, in a pattern similar to Israel's wilderness sojourn for 40 years, Jesus is tempted, and yes, Jesus does battle with the evil one. But in the wilderness... Jesus is also prepared for a public launch of his ministry. In the wilderness, a site of contestation is also a site of transformation. So the spirit who led him into the wilderness is the spirit who leads him through the wilderness, is the spirit who leads him into the, to Nazareth in the synagogue where he declares from Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Prathia Hall, whose voice you heard a little bit earlier makes this claim that ministry happens between the wilderness and the cliff. Jesus proclaims the year of the Lord's favor from Isaiah 61, and he doesn't get into trouble then. He starts talking about Naaman the Syrian and the widow of Zarephath. That's when he starts to get in trouble, when he proclaims that God wants to send the people out into the wilderness to find people in the there out there. That's when they want to run him off a cliff. This is a controversial, prophetic, powerful moment, a moment in which Jesus declares that he's come to reach those in the there, out there. Here's Prathia Hall, and maybe the volume will be not as difficult. I don't want to mess with it. What a ministry. What a mission. What a message. That land, as well as this land, cries out for good news to the poor, deliverance to captives, sight for the blind, freedom for the oppressed. This is indeed the greatest sermon ever preached, the greatest sermon we can ever preach. Indeed, if what we do in the pulpit is not good news to the poor, deliverance to the captives, sight to the blind, healing for the broken, and freedom for the oppressed. It may be sweet, it may be eloquent, it may even be deep, but it ain't preaching. Martin Luther King Jr. described Prathia Hall as one of the best preachers he had ever heard. They were at a prayer meeting a few years before the March on Washington, and at this prayer meeting, he stood up and prayed, Lord, I have a dream. I have a dream. He talked about the dream. Many others who were at that prayer meeting have confirmed that Dr. King said, I like that. I want to use that someday. Wilderness ministry, ministry that takes place between the wilderness and the cliff. In Ulrich Mauser's book, Christ in the Wilderness, he makes this observation in the Gospel of Mark as well. He takes a special interest in the wilderness in Mark. 
After the temptation in Mark 1.35, Jesus actually retreats to wilderness spaces throughout his ministry. You might remember some of these stories that even in Luke's gospel, Satan waited until an opportune time. That's how that story ends. So Mauser observes that the English, which is often translated as lonely places or solitary places, is actually the same word for wilderness, that that word is used there. That word shows up three times in the feeding of the 5,000, Mark 6, 31, 32, 35, and once again in the feeding of the 4,000, Mark 8, verse 4. Jesus retreats into a wilderness space, according to Mauser, where he does battle. And every time he leaves that space, he returns with renewed power. I would be missing a theme if I don't draw a connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and it's this idea of the Day of Atonement. Recall the instructions given to Aaron in Leviticus 16 that he is to kill one goat as a sin offering and to set aside a live goat. Here are the instructions. Or we read uh, what happened at that particular moment. When Aaron had finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward, or when he has finished, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the wilderness in the care of someone appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a remote place, and the man shall release it into the wilderness. The assumption, of course, is that the sins of the people are taken as far away from them as possible out in the wilderness, where they will rest on one who will die in the there out there so that their sins will be remembered no more. Leviticus 16 introduces us to the concept of the scapegoat, that is, the one on whom is placed the sins of others, who must carry for others what they cannot carry for themselves. Perhaps you might know where I'm headed. For there is that day of atonement to which the first day of atonement points. In Isaiah 53, verse 4, we read, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. In 1 John 2, verse 2, Christ is the prop propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Perhaps you might remember John's greeting to Jesus where he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the whole world. Or also in 1 Peter, he bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed on a cross in the wilderness outside the camp. The Lord Jesus does for us what God does for us, what God does for individuals and communities in the there, out there, out there, in the out there, Jesus gives us a new beginning with God. And if I were preaching this, I would say Friday gave way to Sunday. I would say that death could not destroy him, to borrow a line from Gardner Taylor, and the grave could not hold him, and Satan could not seduce him, that he got up, even though he died. So we have to consider the implications of this new beginning that God saves us in the wild. Let me suggest to you that those whom Jesus saves in the wild are those whom he calls to be participants in his mission in the wild, which brings me to this theme, the God who sends us in the wild and the idea of sending. Christ sets us free from sin and death through his cross and through his resurrection, but he does so so that we might also be set free for a new life of discipleship and mission. He comes not just that we might have eternal life, but that we might have abundant life in him. We are debtors 
for, to a God who is merciful and gracious, but we are also stewards and ambassadors. Debtors in the sense that our lives are not our own. They belong to God. We have been bought at a price. This is why Paul says in his farewell to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. This is why we can read in 1 Peter 4, verse 2, that we no longer live, quote, for human passions, but for the will of God, end quote. Our lives are not our own. We no longer live for ourselves, but Christ, who for our sake died and was raised, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15. We are debtors. And preachers are also stewards. The gospel itself is not actually ours, even though we have received it. We have received it unto ourselves, but we are also stewards of it. It, too, belongs to God, even though it is for us and for our salvation. Salvation. Preachers do not own the gospel. They are stewards of the gospel. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, they are approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. That's the language of stewardship. Those who have been entrusted recognize that what they have does not ultimately belong to them, it belongs to the one who gives it to them, and it is for a purpose. It belongs to the Lord of the house, the one to whom they must give an account. Those who are debtors and those who are stewards, this imagery is also used, are called to be ambassadors in the message and ministry of reconciliation. We know from 2 Corinthians 5 that because we have been reconciled to God through Christ, therefore we are also called to become Reconcilers for God in Christ. We have been given the message and ministry of reconciliation. Ambassadors go to foreign lands away from their homeland, and they reside in foreign places because they've been sent there by their sovereign. Not every ambassador will be sent to an ideal situation, to a place that is easy to do the work, or to a place that fits nicely with the plans they have laid out for their lives. I have a friend who just found out that he's been assigned to Amman, Jordan. He said, I'll see you in five years. <laughs> what is most important is not whether the ambassador has an easy time in the place where he or she is sent, neither whether the ambassador feels as though that place fits nicely with their plans for the future. What is most important is whether the ambassador goes to the place that the sovereign sends him or sends her, the ambassador's job is not to make much of himself or herself, but to represent the one who sent him or her well, to represent the one who sent the message to the land. Here I'm reminded of the words of Nicholas Zinzendorf, the bishop of the Moravian church, as he exhorted Moravian missionaries before they left for their lifetime of work he would remind them to do three things. Preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. The goal was not the spotlight, nor was it to focus inordinate honor upon oneself, nor was it to push Christ out of the way. The goal was, bring honor to, was to bring honor to the one to whom honor was due. And so, especially since this is a lecture at a seminary to seminarians, just ask a few questions. Could it be that God is more interested in whether you are willing to go to where he sends you than he is in whether or not it fits nicely into the plans that you've made? Not only are our plans subject to change, therefore we must hold them loosely. A more accurate way to put it would be that our plans are subject to our sovereign. An ambassador follows the mandates of the one who sent them. To paraphrase Mother Teresa, so often what we want is clarity, but what we need is faith. Second question, could it be that God is more interested in what you give than he is in what you make? Now don't get me wrong, as someone who went to years and years of school and owes Uncle Sam plenty, uh, so we have to manage our finances wisely. That's not what I mean here. 
It was Andrew McLaren who put it this way, it is not what we possess, but who we are that matters to God. So often we frame our lives in unbiblical words or ideas, even our ministries. What I find so curious is we talk about successful ministries when Jesus had very little to say about success. He had a lot to say about faithfulness and fruitfulness, being faithful with the talents entrusted to us, whatever those would be, and remaining connected to the vine so that we might bear fruit. Will you say yes to God if gospel obedience requires you to go with Peter to places that you would rather not go? What if being a church in the wild would require from us a willingness to enter into sites of contestation, to go to places that are locus obscondidus, to be the church in places that are peripheral rather than central? Saying yes to God might also mean that we are willing to let go of the time and the place that we would choose if we were God. It has been said, and for good reason, that one of the bigger differences between God and us is that God does not think he's us. Will you let God be God, even if it means that you say yes to the periphery rather than to the center? Perhaps in doing so, you will actually be following in the way of Jesus. Here's how the Japanese theologian Kosuke Koyama puts it. The periphery is the place of discipleship. If we follow Jesus, we will come to the periphery with him. I'll put it differently. We must be willing to go to the periphery on Christ's behalf because Christ was willing to go to the periphery on our behalf. And here's where I find the Puerto Rican theologian and missiologist Orlando Costas so helpful. Costas appear, uh, appeals to the language of Hebrews 13, verse 12. Perhaps you remember this verse, which reads, So Christ suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his blood. Costas, in his book, Christ Outside the Gate, contends that Jesus moves the center to the periphery by dying on the cross. In so doing, Costas argues, Christ moves salvation from the central place of the temple to the peripheral place outside the gate. Here's how he puts it. Jesus died in the wilderness among the outcast and disenfranchised. The unclean and defiled territory became holy ground as he took upon himself the function of the temple. Costas' point is that Christ died outside the gate in the peripheral place in order to sanctify the people in the there, out there, transforming a site of contestation into a site of transformation, transforming an instrument of terror into a symbol of hope. But Jesus also died outside the gate in the peripheral place so that those he sanctified would also join him outside the gate in the peripheral place. Do you remember what comes next? Hebrews 13, verse 13. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. Costa saves, or Christ saves us in the wild outside the gate so that he can send us to the wild outside the camp. Here is Costas one more time. To be saved by faith in Christ is thus to come to Jesus where he died for the world, to commit oneself to those for whom he suffered. It is not a ticket to a privileged spot in God's universe, but rather freedom for service. So we should ask the question, what does it mean to be set free for service? It means to serve in a space where God sends us, regardless of whether or not that space is easy, convenient, or attractive. At no point does God promise to make us comfortable. Christian discipleship requires committing ourselves to those who are outside the, camp, outside the gate, outside the camp, outside the religious compound, outside the security and comfort of the redeemed community, to use Costas' phrase, to be set free for service means that we let ourselves be sent by God to the place that He sees fit to send us, even if that place is a place we'd rather not go. 
That phrase, a place we'd rather not go, is taken from John 21, where Jesus explains to Peter that someday someone else will dress him and take him to a place he'd rather not go. In June 1981, the popular author, teacher, and priest Henry Nouwen was invited by Princeton Theological Seminary to deliver a commencement address to seminarians on the occasion of their graduation. And the text that he chose that day was from John 21, Jesus' reinstatement of Peter. Jesus asks the question, do you love me? He gives him a task. And he makes a prediction. The question is, do you love me? The task is, feed my sheep. The prediction is, someday when you are old, someone else will take you to a place you'd rather not go. As it was with Peter, now in argues, so it is with ministers of the gospel who love Christ, who love his church, and who love his world. Over time, faithful preachers, faithful Christian leaders discover that they are, in in fact, the ones who are being led that the one who leads them is quite often leading them to a place that is markedly different from a place where they thought they were headed at the beginning. Here's how Nowen puts it. To grow in the spirit of your Lord means to be led to the same powerless place where he was led. Calvary upon the cross. Your life is not going to be easy, and it should not be easy. It ought to be radical. It ought to be restless. It ought to lead you to places you would rather not go. But you will find that precisely when you find yourself being girded and led to to places you would rather not go, that the Spirit of God is with you. To follow the Jesus who saves us in the wild means that we allow him to send us to the places where he would send us, even if that means the spaces we would rather not go. It means a willingness to be sent to the there out there, outside the gate, outside the camp. And he may send us to spaces that are thriving and flourishing. He may send us to spaces of nihilism and despair. What matters most is that that he sends us and we follow to the spaces that he sends us especially if it's a place we'd rather not go. Salvation and sending, redemption and mission, propitiation and expectation, all of these happen in the wilderness. All of these take place in the wild, the site of new beginning, of transformation, of holy encounter and divine call, the space of special revelation, of cosmic battle between good and evil, a site of contestation that gives way to a site of transformation, the place of the scapegoat, the harvest for the sent ones, Only God himself could take a place that is so often associated with temptation, rebellion, and judgment and transform it into a space of new beginning and transformation. Only God could make a way in the desert, a stream in the wasteland. And so with that, we return to that question, is there a church in the wild? So were Jay-Z and Kanye right, or were they wrong? Is there no church in the wild, or is there one? The short answer to that question is, that depends. Perhaps we could ask a deeper question. The question that every Christian minister and preacher must wrestle with is not whether there is a church in the wild or whether there can be. For in fact, over and over again in Scripture, we see that there is, in fact, a church in the wild, in the there out there. God's word can come to a backwards preacher in a backwards nation at the outer edge of the Roman Empire if that's what God wants to do. God calls, God saves, God sends. Individuals and communities experience new beginnings in the wild. The question that Christian ministers must face is not whether there can be a church in the wild or whether there should be. We know the answer. The real question is whether there will be a church in the wild in this generation whether once again in this age, at this time, there will be voices crying in the wilderness of hopelessness and despair, whether there will be communities that lead communities and bring help to the helpless, healing to the wounded, life in the face of death. 
Let me argue that what the world desperately needs is not more influencers and celebrities. The world most certainly does not need more leaders who genuflect before powers of an age that's passing away. No, what the world needs now more than ever is a new generation of wilderness preachers. Preachers who speak with boldness and clarity and conviction. Preachers who say, prepare the way for the Lord. Thank you. Let's take uh, questions. Um, Jared, we want to be mindful of the time. I know you have a, a lunch event following this lecture. Would you like to take a question or two? Or sure, you? sure. Yeah, this we can yes, take one please. or two questions. Thank you. Your uh, call to action, a, a go, or consider that you might be called to the wild, is I think a persuasive one and a compelling one. And I know this would be another lecture, um, but the line you close on, right? What, what preachers do in the wild say, prepare the way of the Lord. Hmm. What, what does preparing the way of the Lord in the wilderness look like? And I know hmm. that's as different as it is. There, there's so many different wildernesses, um, so I'm sure it depends on context. But, but could you talk a little bit about what preparing the way of the Lord in the wilderness might actually look like once you're there? Yes, great question. And uh, you're here at the ground floor of all of the theoretical, right? The biblical, theological systematic, theological, and we're moving toward the, the so what, but uh, I would have had to do six lectures for that. <laughs> uh, so, great question. I think the short answer to that question is Luke chapter 3. So, what's going on in, in that transformative moment? We have, um, it's, Luke 3 is the only space where John is actually traveling about from place to place instead of stationary. And so, there's good news to be spoken of and proclaimed outside the, the place where one resides. Uh, there's a preaching of baptism and forgiveness of sins, baptism of repentance and the forgiveness of sins, which is a phrase that shows up over and over again in the Gospel of Luke. And so you have uh, a fulfillment of the Word of God and that the Word of God is the central actor in the story. So kind of like from the sermon on Tuesday, a preacher who's grounding himself or herself securely in God's word. You have the good news, the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, but you also have the good news of the kingdom that there's enough to go around, that people who don't have enough could have enough if we have eyes to see those in need. And so there's a, a preaching of an exalting of Christ. There is a preaching of the kingdom, a, a, an ethically vital witness, I said on Tuesday. Uh, and then, of course, there's an unambiguously Christian center, Christ at the core, an announcement that Christ has come, is come, will come. And I didn't say much about this on Tuesday, but there's also the idea of eschatological subversion, which Justo Gonzalez talks about this too, that eschatological subversion also means that God has a way of turning things around, that things might appear to be one way, but they're actually another way in the eyes of God and through the eyes of people of faith. And so I like what Kevin Van Hooser says. He says that theology is a description of the way things really are in Jesus Christ. And so whether we're in spaces of thriving and flourishing or spaces of nihilism and despair, let me argue that there's lots of nihilism and despair of spaces of thriving and flourishing too. We just have to have eyes trained to see it. So uh, sometimes our preaching only stops at explanation. And so I mentioned this, Tom Long has an essay called No News is Bad News in a Christian Sermon. And so we are called to in, engage in explanation, but explanation for the sake of proclamation. And so we have exposition, we have explanation, we have illustration application, we have proclamation. There is, uh, Tom Long also likes to say that Christ announced you don't have to live this way anymore. That's good news. Uh, that's good news. In his earthly ministry, he's doing it through the cross and resurrection. He's inviting captives to be set free. I would say that the idols are no longer wood and stone, right? So what false allegiances, what false affections, uh, what idols need to be jettisoned in that performance of the contest between the narrative of Yahweh and the narrative of the world that's passing away? So we don't even know what we don't know about how our false allegiances and alliances have taken us away from the way things really are in Jesus Christ.
That was going to be a short answer, but good question. Good question. Thank you. All right. I see our time is up. Thank you again. God bless you. And we have thoroughly enjoyed uh, your being with us. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a joy to be here. I'm now an adopted child of Beeson. You so are, indeed. Well, thank you. Grafted lifetime. in. Grafted in. Thank you so much, everyone. I can hang around if you have questions. God bless you. Thank, thank you. you.